Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Leah Sandals. I'm senior editor at the Alzheimer's Society of Canada and moderator for today's conversation. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to How to Reduce Your Dementia Risk, Top 10 Tips Plus Emerging Research. This talk is presented by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada in partnership with Brain Canada, and you can find out about both of our organizations in the chat. First, just a few items before we get started. This session is being offered in both English and French. Just choose the language you desire at using the interpretation button that should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You'll also notice that poll questions perhaps already have or will occasionally pop up on your screen during this session. Your answers help us understand how to do better in the future with this series, so please do provide your feedback. This talk is being recorded and will be made available on the Alzheimer's Society website and on our YouTube channel in the coming days. Uh, this is the conversation. Uh, the chat is open and being moderated uh, should you wish to introduce yourself or share any resources or experience. If you do have questions for our panel, though, please use the Q&A feature that should also be around the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to get to all the questions during this session, but any that we don't answer live will be followed up on by email in the days to come. I'm coming to you today from land that is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and that's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I also acknowledge that Toronto, where I live and where the Alzheimer's Society of Canada offices are, is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. The Alzheimer's Society encourages you to learn more about Indigenous-led and co-led initiatives in dementia, including, but not limited to, the Native Women's Association of Canada's Dementia Tools, the website of Anishinaabek Dementia Care, the Canadian Indigenous Cognitive Assessment Site, and dementia resources from the National Collaborating Centre for Indigenous Health, to name just a few. The websites uh, and links for these organizations are now in the Zoom chat, for you to use, share, support, and learn from. Um, we're going to start this today with uh, something a little different for Dementia Talks Canada. Um, we do a little less often, but it's a brief slide presentation with those top 10 dementia risk reduction tips. And then we will introduce our esteemed panel and have a group conversation, as well as a Q&A near the end of the session. So let's get to it. 10 ways to reduce your risk of dementia. Next slide, please, Dave. And just in case you're worried about, um, if you're worried about missing any of these tips, uh, please know that we also have a summary available 24 seven at alzheimer.ca slash reduce your risk. And we're really putting a push out on this this month, World Alzheimer's Month every September, because this year the theme of World Alzheimer's Month is reduce your risk and that it's never too early and never too late to reduce your risk. So while some risk factors for dementia can't be changed, like age and genetics, for instance, in my family, there's a kind of genetic, uh, higher genetic risk for dementia because we have a certain kind of FTD in my family. Um, and I'm getting older every year, for example, there are many ways we can all take action to reduce our own relative dementia risk. So please follow, next slide please, Dave, follow as many of these 10 evidence-based ways as you can to reduce your risk. Uh, we've heard from neurologists before in these Dementia Talks Canada sessions that if you can't take action on one tip, try to take action on the ones that you can. Um, you know, uh, it's important to, to, to start. Uh, and if you already live with dementia, these 10 tips can help you improve your quality of life and it can help some people with symptom management as well. So next slide, please. The first tip is to protect and support your hearing. Uh, an amazing statistic is that hearing loss in midlife can increase relative dementia risk by an average of 90%. So midlife, 45 to 65, my Gen X people, keep an eye on your hearing loss um, because the thing is that any, any loss acquired during that time is largely eliminated if you use a hearing aid to correct for that loss. 
Uh, but in the meantime, protect your hearing uh, at work and at play. Um, and if you need help with hearing loss, we posted some information in the chat uh, from nonprofits that can assist with that. The second tip uh, is seek support for depression. Um, this is something I have personal experience with. I wanna reassure anybody who's dealing with depression, you're definitely not alone. Depression in later life can increase relative risk of dementia by an average of 90%. Another huge statistic, right? Um, the good news is the American Psychiatric Association says that depression is the most treatable of mental disorders. Between 80 and 90% of people with depression eventually respond well to treatment and almost all patients gain some relief from their symptoms. So do please speak to your healthcare provider if you have one or get free 24 seven support for mental health at wellnesstogether.ca, 1-866-585-0445 uh, or text wellness to 741741. Those details are also in the chat and will be posted when we post this video uh, for the talk later. On to our third tip, another big one. As best you can, avoid concussion and traumatic brain injury. We did a whole talk about this uh, back in the spring, um, which I can link you to as well. Later on, uh, traumatic brain injury in midlife. So that's the 45-65. Again, my Gen X folks out there, be careful. It can increase relative risk of dementia by an average of 80%. Um, but if you've had traumatic brain injury in the past, you can still reduce your dementia risk by taking action on the other tips in here and also by trying to reduce your future risk of reconcussion or re-injury. Um, there's lots of wonderful tips from national nonprofits who specialize in injury prevention. We've posted some in the chat. Big one is just paying attention to your surroundings when you're out walking, rolling, driving, even in your own home, um, playing safe at sports, obeying the sports rules that you're engaging in. Um, more tips available at braininjurycanada.ca if you need support living with a brain injury and also at parachute.ca slash concussion for some great expert tips on avoiding concussion at work and at play. Fourth tip is stay socially active. I love this tip because it's one that people often don't think about and I think it's really underplayed in uh, in what's out there usually. So social isolation in later life, which is over 65, can increase relative dementia risk by an average of 60%. But the great news is that there's so many ways to stay socially active. I say this even as an introvert myself. Um, we've got suggestions from the National Institute on Aging in the US. Uh, video chats count, virtual calls count with friends and family members in terms of reducing your isolation, playing cards or games either in person or online with other people. Uh, try different restaurants with your loved ones, join a hobby group, volunteer, visit a community or senior center. We've got a whole list and there are links that are going to be posted in the chat for that as well. The fifth great tip that's important is protect your heart because high blood pressure in midlife, age 45 to 65, increases relative risk of dementia by an average of 60%. So that's nothing to, uh, to fool around with. Um, if you've been prescribed antihypertension medication, take it because international research has found that antihypertension treatment for high blood pressure is the only known effective preventative medication for dementia. It's really incredible. Um, what's good for your heart is good for the brain. Um, monitor and manage your blood pressure and heart health. Talk to your healthcare provider if you have one. And we've got tips from heart and stroke in the chat that are really helpful. Um, and Heart and Stroke is also a great organization if you're recovering from heart issues and want to get back on track. A sixth tip is one that we hear a lot for a lot of health issues, quit smoking. I know it's not easy, can often take repeated attempts no matter when you're quitting during your life. Um, smoking, but it is possible. And smoking in later life can increase relative risk of dementia by 60%. And the great thing is that stopping smoking, even in later life, even over 65, really improves your risk. Never too late to reduce your risk in this way. Talk to your healthcare provider, find free support for quitting at canada.ca slash quit smoking or smokershelpline.ca. Uh, you can also reach Smokers Helpline at 1-877-513-5333. 
our seventh tip, manage your medical conditions. This is a whirlwind tour through all the tips, but um, there's also important, and we're going to talk more about them after this is wrapped. So just a minute. Um, diabetes in later life can increase relative risk of dementia by an average of 50%, later life being over 65. Obesity in midlife can increase relative risk of dementia by an average of 60%. So both of these are chronic medical conditions. It's important to work with your healthcare provider to manage these as well as any other chronic medical conditions you might have. Um, we have some tips around uh, for managing diabetes. If you need support, visit diabetes.ca, call 1-800-BANTING or email info at diabetes.ca. For more resources and advo really great advocacy on better understanding the chronic disease of obesity, visit obesitycanada.ca. They also have resources there for healthcare professionals or for you to bring to a healthcare professional if that's something that you are interested in doing. Our eighth big tip is, this is the one that a lot of people often hear first, but percentage-wise it was lower than the other ones I've presented so far in terms of an average risk. So um, I wanted to prioritize those other ones first, but Here's one you hear a lot about, be physically active each day, has so many benefits, including that physical inactivity in later life increases relative risk of dementia by an average of 40%. So by getting out, being active every day, you can reduce your relative risk of dementia by that average of 40%. Get moving however works for you. It doesn't have to run, you don't have to run a marathon. You don't even have to go to necessarily the gym unless you love going to the gym. You can walk, you can roll, jog, dance swim, bike, you can garden, do chores or yard work, all of that counts. Any physical activity is better than none at all. Um, we have free exercise tips and videos from uh, amazing organizations at participaction.ca. Those are tips for all ages. There's a free movement program for seniors that's available at safe-seniors.ca developed by McGill. And there's also amazing exercise tips for folks living with dementia at DementiaExercise.com and DementiaWellnessCanada.com. We're getting to the end here. Our ninth tip for reducing dementia risk is to drink less alcohol. Um, I'm also just going to ask that our tech support puts um, the links that we've discussed uh, for managing um, medical conditions and also the uh, exercise tips in the chat. Uh, if not now, we'll do it later. But drink less alcohol. Another big one, okay? So in midlife, drinking more than 12 standard drinks a week increases relative dementia risk by an average of 20%. So if you wanna reduce your dementia risk, it's better to stay below those 12 standard drinks a week. Uh, the good news is uh, there's almost never been a better time to uh, have options for reducing alcohol consumption. There's a huge sobriety or sober curious movement out there, huge amount of mocktail, alcohol-free drink options, lots of group support in things like dry January, dry February, and coming up soon, sober October. Um, if you need help with limiting alcohol, you can speak to your healthcare provider. There's also some really helpful tips from the Canadian Cancer Society and the University of Calgary that we will drop into the chat. And the 10th and final top tip for reducing dementia risk or improving quality of life while living with dementia is aim to get quality sleep. Uh, sleep is really important to brain health. I think all of us who've, who've gone through a few <laughs> nights of poor sleep uh, know that from experience. Um, you know, but now a number of studies have found that poor sleep can increase dementia risk. Research is ongoing about how much risk a poor sleep consistently may bring but we know that having better sleep can support your brain health at any age. So aim if you can to get six to eight hours a night. Talk to your healthcare provider if you're having difficulty with sleep. The government of Canada has some helpful tips on improving sleep like uh, that we are going to also drop into the chat. Among them is review your medications with your physician or pharmacist regularly because I've spoken to people who are living with dementia whose sleep was made worse by some of the medications that they were on for various health conditions and they found their quality of life really improved um, in daily activities of living once they got those medications sorted um, in terms of timing, dosage, type. So that can be a big one that a lot of people forget among the programming we get about uh, sleep hygiene. So thus ends our whirlwind overview of 10 top tips for reducing dementia risk or improving quality of life while living with dementia. Again, you can find these at alzheimer.ca slash reduce your risk. 
Uh, and if you ever want to delve more into the Lancet report on dementia prevention, which is where we pulled most of these stats, we're going to drop that in the chat here too. Um, now it is my great pleasure, thank you for your patience everyone, to introduce the esteemed panelists who are joining this conversation today. Uh, all of our speakers have recently received awards and grants from the Alzheimer's Society Research Program, which distributed nearly 6 million this year to 44 dementia researchers, including many awards in collaboration with Brain Canada and other amazing partners. Um, first, I'm going to welcome Dylan Guan, a doctoral student at the University of Calgary who is researching how to better detect and address early dementia risk. Hi, Dylan. Thanks for joining us. Next, I have Rebecca Hernandez Gamboa, a doctoral student at the University of British Columbia who is researching how different kinds of exercise affect brain function. Um, now, we thank, great to have you here, Rebecca. Thanks for joining us from the West Coast. Now we welcome as well, Annalise Laplume, a postdoctoral researcher at Toronto Metropolitan University and at McGill University's Douglas Research Center, who is studying how lifestyle can impact dementia risk differently for women. And wonderful to have you here, Annalise. Thanks for making time. And uh, bringing up the last part here, we're so grateful to have Mayuri Ruthirakohan, a postdoctoral researcher at Sunnybrook Research Institute, who is studying how groups of cardiovascular risk factors can impact overall risk for dementia. So thank you so much, all of you for joining us and for sitting through that presentation. <laughs> I know you all know so much about dementia risk. Um, I hope we could start with a question around that, building off of that. So we've briefly reviewed 10 well-established ways to reduce dementia risk. What has each of your researches so far indicated that you think more people should know about these risk factors or about other risk factors for dementia? Maybe Dylan, if you wanna get us started. Sure thing. So first of all, just great presentation, Leah. I really, really like that list of 10 modifiable risk factors for dementia. We pay attention to them all the time in dementia research. One thing that I'm really interested in looking at is, and what I want other people to know, is that a lot of these risk factors for dementia, um, they are also potential symptoms of you know, the diseases that lead to dementia. So when we see changes in hearing loss and social interaction and depression and sleep in older age, not only does you know addressing these uh, things potentially reduce the risk of dementia, but they might also be signs that the disease process has already begun. Now, I don't want everyone to be con super concerned here, but it is something that if you do notice these changes suddenly appearing and getting more severe as you get older, it is something I think you should probably let your healthcare provider know, and that could just allow them to provide a more comprehensive assessment of dementia risk. But what's also really, really cool, I think, is that if you address things like you know, traumatic brain injury, uh, smoking, um, hearing loss, cardiovascular risk factors, those don't only protect against changes in memory as you get older, they also protect against some of these other symptoms of dementia, like depression, like hearing loss, and like sleep. And so, again, really, really, I really want everyone to focus on these, these factors that Leah mentioned, because they protect against so many things, not just memory. Thanks, Dylan. That, that's a great point. Um, Rebecca, what are your thoughts based on the research you've done so far? So in our lab, we study how different types of exercise training can be beneficial for our brain health. And I think it's really important to think about how exercise training really targets several of the risk factors that you just talked about. So it can help um, keep us physically active, but it also protects our heart. It also helps manage different medical conditions. It's also a great way to stay socially active. So in general, we like to promote exercise training as a very good way to reduce dementia risk. And we like, like Leah mentioned before, um, we can do different types of exercise training, whether you enjoy going out for a walk or you are a more experienced runner, or if you enjoy lifting weights, there's many different ways in which you can exercise that could pre potentially prevent um, dementia onset. Amazing. Yeah, I appreciate that reminder. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to delving into the different types of exercise findings you get more. Um, 
Next, though, I'm wondering about Annalise. Um, what are your thoughts about these dementia risk factors? What do you think, you know, the general public should know more about them or other other factors that don't often get talked about? A good question. Um, so in my research, we've looked at how these risk factors influence people across all ages. We've looked at ages 18 to 90 years old, and we've looked at over 20,000 people. So really large data sets of people. Um, and what we know is that these risk factors influence mental performance um, it, for all ages and for all health conditions. So even if you're healthy aging and you're not at risk of Alzheimer's disease, they do influence your memory and your attention. Um, all the more if you are at risk or you have Alzheimer's disease. Um, now, one of the things about Alzheimer's disease is that it's a progressive condition. So the effects of Alzheimer's disease on the brain start to happen decades before someone gets a diagnosis. So ideally tackling these factors as early as possible, um, but also it's never too late, is important. Um, some of the things that are really interesting in my research is that we found that um, the effects of these risk factors on brain aging were more were bigger than the effects of age. So aging alone is not the complete picture. Each risk factor had the same effect on mental performance as around three years of aging. So to put that into context, a non-smoker had the same mental performance as someone who did smoke, but was three years older. So the effect of smoking sort of, you know, accelerated brain aging by about three years. And the other interesting thing that we found is that these factors add up so someone who has no risk factors could have similar brain performance as someone who's one or two decades younger than them, but has many risk factors. So for example, say you're a 40 year old and you have no untreated hearing loss, um, depression, diabetes, and high blood pressure. You might have similar mental performance to someone who's 10 or 20 years younger than you, but who does have all of those risk factors. So the take home message is it's important to minimize any and all risk factors. We did also find in my research that these factors influence men and women differently, and that's something that I'm looking at right now as well. Interesting. Thank you. I look forward to hearing more about that. Um, and I appreciate your your note that in a way that taking action can 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 uh, change kind of like the biological age or component. Sorry, I'm not I'm not a scientist. So I'm not saying exactly the same, but thank you. I also, of course, want to hear your thoughts, Mayuri, on um, these major risk factors that are kind of the big, so one of some of the big 10, um, what are your thoughts about them or other ones that are maybe lesser known? Yeah, I think this is a really important topic. As you mentioned with the Lancet Commission, these risk factors um, in the Lancet report, which you can see the link there, it accounts for about 40% of dementia cases. And these are modifiable risk factors. So like Annalise mentioned with age, that's not a non, that's a non-modifiable risk factor. We can't help age. But I think what's important to know is that we can substantially reduce our risk by treating modifiable risk factors that you highlighted. Um, and often in research and clinically as well, you see that these risk factors are treated or studied on an individual level. So we'll look at how hypertension affects dementia or how to treat hypertension clinically, and then we treat diabetes, we might treat diet and depression separately. And so we bring this big issue of polypharmacy, so treating people with multiple drugs. What we're finding though, is that often these risk factors co-occur with one another. If we look at cardiovascular risk factors alone, so that includes things like high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, about 50% of individuals have more than one risk factor. So you really want to kind of get into the root cause of what's causing these risk factors. Are you having hypertension due to underlying diabetes? Um, there's also growing research with um, having a diagnosis of depression alters your biology, like your inflammatory response, which increases your risk of hypertension and diabetes. So there's really interesting work out there that I think you can really reduce the um, polypharmacy out there by kind of taking the whole picture and um, treating um, your groups of risk factors altogether. Interesting. Yeah, I appreciate that because often, yeah, as you've as you've mentioned, people get maybe diagnosed for individual conditions, and sometimes I imagine even sent to different specialists for those different conditions. But in fact, they can be connected in ways that are not always um, recognized as super widely. Um, so thank you for that. Um, that's really great. I, I I love all the insights um, that you've shared. So. 
Um, I'm curious about your own research too. I mean, what do each of you hope to find out or to be more certain about when, you know, the project you're working on right now that is funded by the Alzheimer's Society Research Program is complete? What do you hope to have more certain answers about? Maybe Mayuri, if you want to start this time, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so we kind of picked up on these groups of cardiovascular risk factors that co-occur with one another in a large data set of 11,000 individuals. However, we found this these data sets that we were accessing were um, really, um, they didn't really, they weren't really multi-ethnic. They were primarily white. Um, they happened to be a lot of males who were highly educated. And this is just one of the limitations that we face in um, kind of uh, prospective cohorts. Um, so for what I want to do next is actually I'm accessing an Ontario Health Administrative data set of individuals um, who see clinics at family practice or even in the hospital. Um, so they um, have public health records and we'll be able to go into their records and see how their risk factors group together. And so because we're able to do this, we'll actually have a multi-ethnic cohort of individuals, um, us uh, individuals who are attending this talk today. Um, and I think it will be more translatable and more, um, we'll be able to draw conclusions based on real data and hopefully um, generate ideas for new studies, like what kind of treatments can we use to treat groups of risk factors or what other clinical trials can we explore or neurobiology, like what's happening, what's actually happening here and how can we target them? Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, so to hope you hope to have a better sense looking at this Ontario-wide data set of um, ways that risk factors can happen at the same time and better ways to address them. Um, again, not looking at them kind of individually. I also like what you said about having a more diverse uh, sample that you're drawing on because um, while we're drawing on the Lancet Commission's findings, one thing the Lancet Commission acknowledges in their own report, if you go to the link, is that most of the studies they're basing it on are from higher income, um, wider higher income uh, groups of studies. Uh, so yeah, that's that's really good to hear that it's it, there's an increasing emphasis on um, more diverse studies. Um, I think I'll go in reverse this time, yes, too. So Annalise, I'll call on you next. Um, I know you're working on, as you said, some studies around around uh, available gender data. It doesn't always in include, those older data sets don't always include, let's say, non-binary folks or intersex folks, but there's a lot about um, women and men. Can you tell us a bit more about what you hope your research will find out about? Sure. So my research is looking at how the ways to prevent dementia that you mentioned are different in men and women. Um, and this is really important because almost two thirds of people with Alzheimer's disease are women. Um, and so at age 65, one in five women are at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, and to put that into perspective, as real a concern as breast cancer is to women's health, women in their 60s are over twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease for the rest of their life as they are to develop breast cancer. So it is quite a big concern for women's health. Um, the good news is that early findings from our research suggest that the ways of um, delaying or lowering the risk of dementia may have a bigger protective effect for women than for men. Um, and it's crucial to study this increased protection because women are at higher vulnerability. So um, when we're done with our research, we'll provide guidelines tailored separately for men and for women. Great, yeah, I didn't realize that until I spoke to you that dementia risk for women over 65 is so much higher than their breast cancer risk. So thanks for highlighting that and looking forward to your recommendations when they come out. Um, Rebecca, uh, how about your research? I know you're, you're looking at different types of exercise and how they can have different impacts, is that right? Correct. So a few years ago, we were more interested in studying if exercise training could really benefit our cognitive functions and reduce our dementia risk. But there's plenty of evidence out there that kind of proves that, in fact, exercise does have an impact on brain health. So nowadays, we're more interested in learning specific uh, or researching more specific questions. So, for example, um, with my doctoral um, thesis and with my whole research project, I want to learn what are like more optimal types of exercise training for different types of individuals. So 
for example, aerobic training, which includes things like walking or jogging or cycling versus resistance training, which is more uh, exercise that is aimed at making our muscles stronger, um, or if maybe a combination of the two types of training is optimal. Um, so I'd like to know more information on that. What is the optimal form of exercise training? Also, who benefits more and why? So like Annalise was saying before, um, maybe someday we'll be able to answer, should males and females be exercising differently? Um, so basically, we're trying to refine exercise recommendations so that hopefully one day a physician or different medical professionals will be able to see a patient's characteristics and prescribe exercise in a more specific way that would be the most impactful for the most impactful for the brain health. Amazing. That would be great. I mean, sometimes we do get questions here at the Alzheimer's Society about wanting specific programs, recommendations, let's say, like a specific program somebody could follow to help prevent dementia. So I know that um, when you do have those findings, they'll, they'll probably find a lot of interest. Um, and again, uh, I think it, earlier when we had some conversations before this, uh, we talked about how, again, there's not a lot of data right now on um, non-binary and intersex folks. Like the research tends to break down mostly around men and women in terms of gender. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to finding out if one day that also enters the picture. Um, and Dylan, thanks for, for your patience here. There's, uh, how about your research? What, what are your reflections on it um, right now? Yeah, so one of the things that, I, as I mentioned before, I'm investigating is trying to see, you know, how do these different risk factors that we've been talking about, do they only really protect against changes in cognition, like thinking and memory, or do they also protect against some of these other symptoms that you see in dementia, things like changes in behavior, um, which is really, really prominent, you know, when you have dementia patients and their families coming into the hospital, one of the biggest complaints is about changes in behavior and personality, like they tend to have less motivation, they tend to be more agitated. And in one of the, the you know, one of the studies that I've recently been, we've been working on, we do find that things like education, like the complexity of the job that you've worked throughout your life and whether or not you actually participate in um, keeping yourself, you know, challenged cognitively, like doing puzzles and things like that during um, older age, that does seem to actually protect against these behavioral changes. So people who do these types of things or have a higher education, do more complex jobs and, and engage frequently with mental exercises, they do actually show um, a lower lower chances of showing these behavioral symptoms like agitation and depression and de decreased motivation. And so a lot of the research that I'm going to be doing in the in the future is seeing how these other risk factors um, like exercise, like diet, um, even menopause, I think someone mentioned in the Q&A box about menopause, how do these things affect the different aspects of dementia risk, including cognition, but also behavioral um, and sensory and motor functions that we see in dementia. And if you're interested in participating in this research, we are actually recruiting. So I'm just going to quickly send a link into the chat. But yes, we do um, we do, do a lot of this research. And if anyone's interested in these things, they are free to, to join and participate in this research. That's great. Thanks for sharing information about research in the chat. I know that uh, I've participated in research studies myself, given my family's history of dementia. Um, and it's been great opportunity in so many ways to learn more about um, dementia, to learn more about um, my own risk. And uh, I, I strongly encourage it. It's a great way to access specialist knowledge for anybody who's thinking about it. And also please, Rebecca, Annalise, Mayuri, if you are interested in, in helping recruit participants, do feel free to drop it here in the chat or let me know later and we'll post it when we post the video as well. Um, Thank you all. I'm really excited about all of your research. I'm so glad that the Alzheimer's Society Research Program could help support it. Um, one thing I always like to ask at these panels, and especially here when we talk about risk reduction, is what do you think governments or healthcare organizations in Canada should do next about risk reduction? Um, I ask this in part because um, I know from my own learning, which continues to grow, and I know you know this too, but is um, we talked about individual uh, risk factors people can change, but we all know the reality is some people have more resources to make those changes than other people do. Um, there's something called social determinants of health, which is 
you know, um, about how societal structures affect how much people can improve their own health uh, or not. Um, so anyway, we don't need to talk about that specifically, but to me, that relates a bit sometimes to what governments and healthcare agencies can do. So over to you. I want to start with somebody who hasn't had a chance to start yet. Um, Annalise, uh, what are your thoughts on what governments and healthcare organizations can do around dementia risk? Um, that's a great question. So I think because dementia poses an increasing challenge to our growing aging population, um, it is a societal issue. And so it's important for governments and healthcare organizations to target education towards dementia prevention and risk reduction. Um, because the earlier we can you know, detect and prevent dementia, the better. Um, so we often find, and I, I often find when talking to people, um, and this is completely normal, that as people get older, they're concerned about dementia affecting themselves or others. So I think that educational messages would be well received because people do want to know what they can do to tackle all that uncertainty. You know, when you're uncertain about something, you start to get hope when you think about, well, what are steps that I can take? And the steps that you mentioned today, such as getting exercise or having social connections are all positive actions. Um, and so spreading that message would be really important. Um, and I think the, the message that people you know, should know and that's very encouraging is that changeable lifestyle factors account for at least 40% of worldwide dementias. So all those steps that you mentioned today. Um, and from my research, I think educational messages can highlight two things. First, the more actions you take to reduce your dementia risk, the better. So try to reduce any and all risk factors. And the second is that behaviors that are good for your heart and your body's health are also good for your brain. Um, and that's just repeating what you've said, but things like getting exercise or managing cholesterol help prevent heart disease, but also dementia. Thanks, Annalise. Yeah, education is so important. And uh, often we tend to lean on um, uh, the media to help get the message out. Um, I know from having worked in the media industry prior that it's a it's an industry itself that's quite challenged right now. Um, so and social media is where so many people get information about anything through Google search. So uh, we are trying at the Alzheimer's time Society of Canada to improve our education efforts there. But I agree uh, we could all do more organizationally and uh, governmentally. Um, who would like to answer next? Uh... I can go ahead if you would. Great. So um, I think it's really important that we think that in order to actually prioritize uh, prevention, we need to think about inclusion and access. So like you mentioned before, um, it kind of focusing only on an individual level and asking every individual to take on all of these um, behaviors to target different risk factors can be a little bit overwhelming, especially if they don't have all of the resources that they might need in order to tackle those, those risk factors. So um, in our area, for example, where we know exercise training can be so beneficial and can actually tackle several of those several of those risk factors, we need to consider things like providing incentives or tax credits for people who exercise during middle age and older adulthood. And another really important thing, I think, is providing more spaces where middle aged and older adults can engage in physical activity in a safe and fun way, because gyms seem to be designed with young people in mind. Right, but there aren't enough welcoming spaces and inclusive spaces for newcomers or older adults to show up and engage in regular exercise. So we need to consider aspects like physical safety, but also the sensory needs that older adults, especially if they're already experiencing some kind of cognitive impairment, like mild cognitive impairment, um, we need to consider their sensory needs. So having good lighting in those spaces, uh, keeping walking areas uh, very tidy and easy to ambulate, also keeping noise uh, in a manage manageable level so that it won't be too overwhelming for an older adult. Um, so trying to design spaces that are really self and safe and welcoming for older adults, I think is a, an important thing that uh, communities need to start prioritizing. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, I'm sure that actually addressing some other sensory or inclusion issues in built environments uh, in gyms um, could also be helpful to uh, more generally to neurodiverse population. Um, I appreciate that point a lot. Um, who would like to go next? I don't mind uh, okay. going. 
Um, Thanks, Mary. Lisa and Rebecca brought up such important points about um, the physical environment with exercise as well as um, other social determinants. And I think really to progress forward with improving the overall population health, we also need to address health equity as well. Um, access to, for example, with us at Sunnybrook, we do have, um, we recruit patients and enroll patients in Toronto Rehab, which is a structure, structured exercise program has which has shown efficacy. However, all patients or individuals in our community might not be aware of this. And so one thing that we're trying to do is really branch out into our community um, health partners so that family practitioners are actually aware that this is happening and can prescribe it to their patients as well. Because if our family practitioners don't know about it, their patients might not be aware of treatments out there that they can help, uh, that can they can enroll in to seek help. Um, and I think also making sure that your treatments are equitable to your participants as well, or um, to individuals in our community. Um, an exercise program can be built through um, OHIP, uh, which is in Ontario at least, and I'm sure there's other um, public health uh, uh, policies that can incorporate it in. So making sure maybe that research going forward incorporates those kinds of policies. Um, and also just, I, I think everyone hit it on the nail with lifestyle modification is really the number one um, treatment out there um, with physical exercise being uh, kind of the greatest. Of course, more research needs to be uh, done as Annalise's point, uh, Rebecca has pointed out with the types of physical exercise, but I think we're getting there and really getting the message out that um, this we can improve our dementia risk. Thanks so much, Mayuri. Um, it's great, uh, great points. Um, and yeah, I'm always, always impressed too at like how much hearing, getting a hearing aid can help if you have hearing loss or, um, you know, getting that depression treated. Um, so uh, lots for all of us to to work on and address there um, on so many fronts. Thank you for that insight. Dylan, um, we'll head to you and then we'll go to our Q&A. Yeah, and I just want to, again, reemphasize that you know, again, on the theme about diversity and equity, it's really important to know, I, I, I do want, you know, governments and, and healthcare organizations in Canada to recognize that a lot of the current tests that we use to identify people at risk for dementia are usually developed with a certain sample in mind. And for example, if, if anyone's ever done any of the cognitive tests that we administer in research and in clinic, you might probably realize that this test might not work very well for certain ethnic groups or people from different backgrounds. And I want governments and healthcare organizations to recognize this so that they can address that. And one of the ways that we can address that is by looking at additional ways to identify people at risk. So in addition to cognition, should we look at behavior? Should we look at hearing? Should we look at changes in sleep and changes in, in walking even, which might be less biased towards certain ethnic groups? I do think that this is a very important topic for the government and for healthcare organizations to consider. Thanks so much, Dylan, and everybody. I know that we've addressed some really big topics in a pretty short time span today so far. Um, so um, I appreciate that a lot. Um, I And I think it's probably time to head to the q and I think there's been some, um, oh, I see there's some, okay. Maybe we should just start with the first one here um, submitted by Emily Belanger at 12.30. And just a reminder to everyone on the call here in our audience, if we don't answer your question live, um, we will make sure you get it answered via email after this talk. I believe everybody had to supply an email address to register for this talk. So that's the email we would use to reach you, okay? Otherwise you can always email publications at alzheimer.ca or info at alzheimer.ca if you have follow-ups. Just wanna say that before we get started. So Emily's question is, if depression is a contributing factor, would hypothyroidism or a slow metabolism also affect risk of dementia? Who would like to try answering that? I wouldn't mind uh, addressing that and then anyone could feel free to add in. Um, so for sure, there's actually studies showing that um, there is a metabolic component to dementia risk um, and things like diabetes and obesity is are due to an underlying metabolic disorder. 
there's actually something called a metabolic syndrome, which consists of different risk factors such as diabetes, waist circumference, obesity, high cholesterol. And so really, um, there are therapies available to really regulate your underlying met metabolism, whether it's through um, diabetes medications. If you have diabetes or if you are at stage one of your diabetes or um, if ex an exercise treatment can alter your metabolism in some way, um, those are other treatments that you can pursue. Um, so yeah, I would say for sure they do affect your risk of dementia. Thanks, Mayuri. Um, yeah, I think it's a great question because, and that's also why it's so important for folks to have access to healthcare workers, healthcare providers in Canada, because uh, my understanding, which is limited, but is that yes, thyroid issues can can play into de depression symptoms. So it's really important to get a proper diagnosis, um, both whether you're looking at dementia or other things. So um, anybody else want to share on any insights to that question? We also have others we can turn other questions to address if, uh, if nobody has anything else to add on that one. Okay. Thank you, Emily, for your question. Um, uh, Let's see, Roy Nakashima has asked, does RAMC, which is Quebec insurance, cover the cost of dementia assessment, particularly if one is trying to establish a baseline prior to actual diagnosis of having dementia? I know none of us, that's a great question, Roy. Um, cost is a question that comes up for a lot of people seeking a dementia diagnosis, um, especially in certain circumstances, like with rarer dementias is my experience. Um, I don't know myself if RAMP covers the cost. Most pro, most would cover diagno basic diagnosis is my understanding in Canada. Um, in terms of establishing a baseline, I'm just gonna share my personal experience that because of the higher risk in my family genetically for dementia, I was able to get a referral from one of my existing doctors to a neurologist to get a baseline appointment done. So it may also depend on what your family's personal genetic risk or what your other risk factors might be that helped me establish a baseline appointment. That's just anecdotal. But I will ask, um, do we have any RAMP Quebec insurance experts on this call or anybody else who wants to speak about the cost factor? I know it's not any of your specific areas of research, but uh, just wanna put that out there. I know, and uh, Mayuri, you're answering some stuff uh, in the chat already. Um, with RAM. Maybe it's any comment in uh, any comment in general about people who have questions about how much, how do I establish a baseline? How do I ask my doctor? You know, I'm concerned about dementia. Um and just any any thoughts? Um if not, uh, I'll, I'll yeah, go ahead. I, I, that question in particular, I am not a Quebec resident, so I'm not sure particularly, but um if you are particularly concerned, I would always approach your family doctor, maybe um, approach them with your concerns, whether it's because of your underlying medical conditions or a genetic risk. Um, I know with genetic risks, um, physicians do um, may consider that uh, uh, means to um, do an assessment or at least follow up yearly or every two years. They might not see a point in doing a dementia assessment right away, um, If you, especially if you would score perfectly on everything and it, it is time consuming sometimes as well um but it, it would flag you for maybe um being followed up annually or biannually as well that's a great great insight thanks so much for your question roy um and if we find out anything else uh, at our office after this i will we will also follow via email um i see that mayuri is is taking on one of the questions um, that's in the chat. So I'll leave you with that one. Andre Campbell asks, the particular role of hormones and the specific female profile of dementia risks have been the subject of a great presentation from MOCA in Montreal. The presenter was a doctor in nutrition and genetics. Um, I think you can access those presentations on the MOCA site, they're definitely recorded. Okay, thank you. That's more of a comment. Thank you, Andre, for sharing that. Um, does anybody else, I know Annalise, you're particularly looking at gender and dementia. Is there anything else you'd want to add about that, about where people can find more resources or exciting talks?
sorry, I was working on my mute button. Um, yes, so there's there's definitely a lot of questions came up on the link between like why the reason why women are at higher risk and the role of hormones and estrogens. Um, so one of the factors is menopause levels. Estrogen is thought to have a protective effect on the brain, and as those levels decrease during menopause, that might put women at a higher risk because so they don't have that protective effect. Um, again, it's not set. All women go through menopause and they don't all get Alzheimer's disease. Um, but there is a link. Uh, so people have asked for more information. There's a very good um, brain exchange webinar by Dr. Jolene Einstein on women with dementia and the role of estrogens in memory. I've linked to that in the chat. Sorry, in the questions. But I'll Thanks. provide more in-depth information. And on a related note, I'll just also jump to Jeanette Green's question. I know we're getting to the end of our session, um, which Dylan, you said you wanted to ask about too. Um, Jeanette Green says she's not clear on the responses about HRT, which is hormone replacement therapy, women, and any dangerous benefits that might be associated with dementia. Yeah, so again, this is this response is coming from some of the work that I did with Dr. Julian Einstein that was mentioned back when I was at the University of Toronto. And it, it's important to note that a lot of the literature on this is actually still quite conflicted. Um, we don't really have a 100% this is the answer. There has been some studies showing that HRT has, you know, does protect against uh, dementia. There have been other studies showing that HRTs have been dangerous or, or at least have no effect or potentially even um, dangerous when it comes to dementia and other types of um, cardiovascular diseases, for example. And I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, the fact that HRTs can be so complex as to when they are administered, what the type of HRTs are, whether they're estrogen based or progesterone based, how long you're, you're taking them, the way you take them. Um, and but that being said, in general, it does seem to be that um, HRTs that are estrogen based and ideally taken for women who have an earlier age of menopause, whether that be due to natural causes or due to hysterectomy or oophorectomy, that tends to show a, a positive effect against reducing dementia risk. But again, the literature is definitely not settled yet for sure. And there's a lot more research to be done. And again, can protect the study that I've been talking about does actually have a questionnaire that will allow us to investigate the, this question further. So if you are interested in participating in that research, please join that study. Thanks, Dylan. Um, yeah, it's a question that often comes up. Um, so what I'm hearing is that the, the information is generally conflicting. Um, thank you so much. We're getting to the end, and I know there's a question for Rebecca specifically. So Rebecca, uh, Michelle, Micheline Esclavo has asked, um, you know, she's heard that doing intense cardio for five to six minutes a day also helps prevent Alzheimer's disease. What kind of comment do you have about that, Rebecca, given your research? Well, if that is a way for you to begin uh, engaging in physical activity and exercise, then I would say that is absolutely a great recommendation. Um, so there are minimum, like minimum recommendations just in general for uh, health as we age. And we're still working on kind of minimal recommendations for how much exercise we should be doing to prevent dementia. So that is still um, work in progress. But uh, if five to six minutes is what you can get started with, then absolutely, that would be a fantastic way to to prevent dementia. And after maybe a few weeks of regularly uh, performing this activity for five or six minutes, maybe you can start to make longer bouts of exercise, right? And mix up the type of exercise that you do. As long as it's something that you're enjoying and something that you can really um, make a habit out of, then absolutely, it will be beneficial and will probably um, re reduce your risk for dementia onset. Wonderful. Um, thank you. Um, those of us on the panel who have answered questions in the Q&A, um, please hit done if we've answered them live, just so they clear out. Thanks. Um, there's another question here from Denise Enns. Does Canada work with other countries in their research about dementia? I know, yes. <laughs> but Dylan probably has more info because he'd like to answer this live as, as, as well as some of our other panelists. After this yeah. one, we will wrap up. Yeah, so this one, this one happens all the time. Um, so I'm sure many of the other um, panelists here have probably worked with other people in, in other countries. The one study that I've been talking about, and sorry for bringing it up so often, but Camp Protect was actually done in collaboration with the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. So even for some of these studies that, you know, different research groups are working on, we do collaborate with other researchers all the time. And I know it's also very common for us to use data 
that has been collected in a different country, like for example, the United States, they offer a lot of data that we have that we don't have here in Canada. And so that helps us answer research questions. And it's also really important that moving forward as we address um, our understanding of dementia in different countries, in different ethnic groups, and um, in terms of equity di and diversity, that we include more participants from different countries and different groups in our research when we investigate dementia. Thank you, Dylan. Um, well, it's 1256, so I would like to keep talking for the next hour personally, but I'm sorry we can't. Um, this has been a really helpful talk. We've had lots of questions. Again, if you did provide your email at registration, we will follow up with you via email. Otherwise, email me and my team at publications at alzheimer.ca for any uh, questions uh, you might have submitted anonymously and we will follow up. So join us, please. Oh, first, thank you so much, panelists. Love what you're doing. It's wonderful to hear about your energy around this topic. Uh, looking forward to reading your research in future. Join us next time on October 25th at 12 Eastern when we'll talk about air pollution and dementia, a timely topic given Canada's record of wildfire and smoke season this year. More info on that at alltimer.ca slash October talk. Uh, we will post this talk and other and associated links in the coming days at alzheimer.ca talks or on our YouTube channel. Please send feedback about this event to us at publications at alzheimer.ca if you wish. And with that, I will say thank you all so much for joining and have a wonderful day.